recording to the cloud. Hey everybody, this is the Rex A, A Rex pop-up call on Friday, June 29th, 2018. Um, we are going to have a lovely conversation. Our guest is Paul Baines, but as usual with our calls, um, we will open with a poem and then I'll hand it off to Todd who, will, uh, who has brought Paul to us and, and will help introduce Paul and bring him into our, into our conversation. Um, but the poem I found um, that's feeling kind of interesting for the moment is titled Around Us by Marvin Bell and goes as follows. We need some pines to assuage the darkness when it blankets the mind. We need a silvery stream that banks as smoothly as a plane's wing and a worn bed of needles to pad the rumble that fills the mind and a blur or two of a wild thing that sees and is not seen. We need these things between appointments, after work, and if we keep them, then someone someday lying down after a walk and supper with the fire hole wet down, the whole night sky set at a particular time without numbers or hours will cause a little sound of thanks, a zipper or a snap to close around the moment and the thought of whatever good we did. Uh, let me read it again. Uh, Paul, Paul, I think you're, there's some ambient noise coming from you, or, or maybe it's Todd, but uh, I'm getting a little bit of squeaks and stuff from uh, somewhere. Squeaks are now gone. Might have been Todd. Um, now I have squeaks again. Huh. Let me, uh, let me read it again. <clears throat> Around Us by Marvin Bell. We need some pines to assuage the darkness when it blankets the mind. We need a silvery stream that banks as smoothly as a plane's wing and a worn bed of needles to pad the rumble that fills the mind and a blur or two of a wild thing that sees and is not seen. We need these things between appointments after work and if we keep them, then someone someday lying down after a walk and supper with the fire hole wet down, the whole night sky set at a particular time without numbers or hours, will cause a little sound of thanks, a zipper or a snap, to close round the moment and the thought of whatever good we did. It's a complicated read, but I really love the, the spirit of the poem. Um, so welcome everybody. Uh, Todd, will you, uh, will you take us in? Yes. Thank you, Jerry, for that poem. Uh, some of you know that I have grown up around the, the Great Lakes, um, mostly Lake Michigan with a little bit of Lake Erie. Uh, having lived in Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, um, the lakes have a very special significance to me. And uh, yes, I did spent a little bit of time on the West Coast too, but came back home here to uh, this bioregion that feels like home. I currently live a half mile away from Lake Michigan. Uh, it moderates all these temperatures. It's, it's present in our lives every day. Uh, and I think it was about three, maybe four years ago uh, that via Twitter, I came across something called the Great Lakes Commons Charter. Uh, and it was, signing a declaration um, that I was going to care uh, for these great freshwater bodies. And I was very moved by the language in it uh, and became curious about the organization, uh, the Great Lakes Commons. Um, having been involved in commoning and commoner, I was fascinated that we're building a commons around uh, freshwater. Uh, and so I learned more about the organization, eventually met Paul. Um, Pia and I have had drinks with him in Milwaukee. Uh, we've had the chance to work together. And the last conversation we had um, was around activism and um, how to activate this movement around caring for uh, freshwater, not just the Great Lakes, but freshwater as a whole. Um, and the conversation had this certain quality to it that I thought would have been, would be an excellent opportunity to bring uh, to this group. And, and that is, um, there's a lot of things that are amiss right now in our world. Uh, and there's a lot of fighting and battles 
um, that we're trying to, many of us are, are trying to win or not lose. Uh, and the question that Paul has posed to me in different forms is, um, how do we weave together these movements in a way that is sustainable, um, both energetically and builds upon itself, um, and is not just the energy of fighting against, but is the gathering for. Um, and this, to me, exemplifies Paul and his work, uh, a man with a big heart, uh, who's capable of anger, but is also uh, trying to spread love, not just... Um, in, in the various communities as which he works, the academic community, uh, the artist community, the activist community, uh, indigenous communities, um, but taking the spirit of the water itself and, and embodying that in a human form and with, with all the generosity he has. So he's invited onto this call to, to talk to us about his work and, and the state of activism in the world today. Is that my cue? That's your cue. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't really know much about this group or where everyone's coming from. Uh, I mean, Jerry just mentioned this uh, forum about trust and everything, and Todd's given a bit of information there. I'm going to bet most people on this call haven't heard of Great Lakes Commons. And I don't know how much of this talk is really about Great Lakes Commons, but it's more about the idea, or I suppose the sort of the forum in which I work and the processes in which I work and some of the questions that perhaps we're all sort of uh, asking. And so there's a couple of different threads to pick up on from Todd's introduction. I'm not sure if I do have questions as well, or, but um, what I can add right now is, you know, actually I'm, I'm sort of, I grew up on Lake Ontario and I'm actually standing next to Lake Ontario right now. Um, I'm actually just doing a short term residency on, um, Toronto Island. If anybody here has been to Toronto, you may know there's, there's an island with an airport and lots of parks, a little theme park, and also a couple of uh, neighbor, little neighborhoods. And um, so I'm and also an arts center. So I'm actually here at the arts center and I'm just by the ferry docks. Um, and so I'm actually right on Lake Ontario as we speak. And so I guess that's sort of sets the backdrop literally that this idea of belonging. And I feel like a lot of social movements are, you know, are using that thread of what is it you are belonging to? What is the moment or the movement or the community you're belonging to? And what I've been a part of for the past six years and what I've been trying to support is this idea of belonging to the Great Lakes, regardless if you're American or Canadian or indigenous or, or settler, Ontario, Chicago, whatever, boater, fisher. So oftentimes the language of stakeholder or citizenship or or um, other forms of identity divide us. And so I just felt like this Great Lakes Commons identity, commoner identity, belonging to the lakes was something that was refreshing, was inclusive, uh, and at the end of the day, transformative, really sort of thinking about that sort of bioregional awareness, that bioregional connection, and that water being one of those elements which helps us break down our, our common understanding around us and the environment or us and water because so much of us are made of water so i'm mostly you know i'm mostly lake ontario right now um a couple of years ago when i was traveling the great lakes for six months uh, i was probably a little bit of all all five and so i'll start off with that to the group putting back to the group around maybe this theme of belonging, what does it mean to you, or what are some examples? And if you have any more questions to me about belonging, or we can pick up a different thread, but the various ways in which Great Lakes Commons, we've been trying to spur that idea of belonging is with a united vision around a commons charter. Uh, we have a collaborative knowledge map where people can add their text, photos, and videos, you know, on a map of the Great Lakes, so the idea of belonging. Um, and we've done a bunch of events around journeying and people cycling, walking, boating, performing, um, cycling in different parts of the Great Lakes um, within their own issue, but connecting to the larger whole. And so that idea of belonging has been a thread through some of our projects. And more, most recently, some of the work that Todd's done with us is this idea of a more you know, critical connection, sort of like within our leadership team or some of our closest supporters, how do we nurture and advance this sort of this idea of a commons leadership or, or internal commons so that our out external uh, ideals around how to how to belong to the Great Lakes can also show up 
and be uh, and be mirrored in our sort of micro or inner our inner circle as well. And so that's an ongoing challenge of how to how to do that with everyone's with the, with the culture of busy, with the culture of fighting against various issues, with seeing issues uh, in terms of like nuclear power waste or pipelines or water shutoffs, there's all these issues that can easily divide a social movement where the greater sense of belonging or the greater cause of action is this idea of reconnection to the to the Great Lakes. And so I'll, I'll, I'll end this first little section on a little bit more of an introduction and this theme of belonging and how it's manifested in some of our, some of our work. Love that. Um, so I'm curious about one of my beliefs is that people have forgotten what commons even are. And every now and then when I have a workshop or a, or a talk, I'll be like, all right, so who, who knows what a commons is? And there'll be like 15 seconds of, of embarrassed silence. And then somebody will say, well, that's like forests, right? And I'll be like, good, 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 keep going, right? And then we explore the notion of commons a little bit. But, but what reactions do you get as you talk about commons just in general? Because I think this is weirdly a very fundamental notion to human society and also something that we have squished out of our present lives. Yeah, I would say there's a real range. There's everything from total to never thought of it to misinterpretation in terms of the tragedy of the comments. Oh God, that paper. You know, oversimplification around everything that we share. So the idea of communal, um, just being a fill-in for things that are shared uh, or commonly or common concern or uh, common, con yeah, common things of the word, the word common being almost um, overly, overly biased. And then lastly, even the idea of suspicion uh, that I wrote a blog post based on a book um, a few months ago now called Unsettling the Commons, which was looking at reclaim the streets and looking at even the um, Occupy movement as a form of, of settler moves to innocence and ways in which we can flatten and erase uh, decolonial conversations and re-indigenizing our presence here on Turtle Island and how commons can, with the language of the commons and sometimes the practice, be a part of that erasure. And so I'd say that that spectrum of ways in which people aren't really thinking about commons um, thoroughly or critically or even even problem even in a way for me, I'm conscious that it could be misinterpreted, or it might even at sometimes be another form of erasure of power. Um, and so I use it very contextually, and so I usually don't talk about reclaiming the commons. Um, depends on who the audience is, and so the sort of general one-on-one with you know all the things that we inherit, share, and pass on, um, but really focusing it on the verb of the practice of commoning as, as more important because just declaring a commons or thinking that a commons exists um, outside of human organization is somewhat essentializing this idea and romanticizing this idea that a commons just exists because it's, it's all there and we all just need to take care of it. Well, there are, actually needs to be the commoning, the rules, the practices, be they formal or informal, and actually the consequences when those things are not followed. I think we can see, take climate change as a perfect example of a tragedy of the commons. Not because we don't have a commons, but because we don't have the governance mechanisms to actually govern climate as a commons. And so we get, we get a lot of misinterpretation. We get a lot of um, inflate, inflating ideas like, well, if it's, it's everyone's, right? And I think, again, when we're looking at issues of settler colonialism, considering something everyone's equally uh, isn't, is, is, is problematic, just like the idea of the 99%. And the book goes into further detail. And I would encourage you, if you want to think about more about commons and unsettling, is to read the blog post on the Great Lakes Commons website. And so for me, commons is a way into a conversation that in some ways at our current moment allows us to get beyond public and private so I think that's a transformative and a, and a, and a, um, a way of emerging um, ways forward. So getting outside that, 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 that deadlock of public or private, it also for me brings in the idea of reciprocity and that is that we are embedded in these systems, be they social or ecological, but that there is a sort of a greater reciprocal dependency, uh, reciprocity of give and take uh, of, of commons, which again, property doesn't quite do um, and nature doesn't quite do. It, it, commons has a level of participation and a level of intimacy and responsibility that I think other forms of stewardship uh, just don't quite 
pulled up. And lastly, I think comments can include an awareness around intergener intergenerational equity. Sorry, I fell off the other way. Not just this generation, so our water, and we need that we need water for today, and you know this generation. What Commons really brings into the to the question uh, our ancestry and future generations of, of of again, what are we leaving behind? How are we becoming a good ancestor? What kind of a guardian are we? And so, really thinking about ourselves is more than just again those identity uh, categories I mentioned earlier, but also getting outside of this short one generation time frame which you know, not only do our political systems only work in four-year cycles, but we only work in a certain, usually, sort of egocentric cycle. And so looking at the water cycle as the sort of time frame, it takes over 300 years for all of the water in the Great Lakes to theoretically flush completely through the system. And so I think that I Commons challenges us to think about what are we leaving behind and what have we inherited much more closely than other forms of environmental management or, or social social discourses or, 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 or let's say management frameworks usually allow for. And so that's some, those are some of my thoughts on the word commons and commoning that I have found you know, useful or productive or ha having to sort of figure this out as we go because I, I never studied commons in school even though I was practicing commoning in, in so many different ways. Um, and again, I, I do think this is really a largely a project of recovery, not so much uh, of in invention. And so it's really just thinking about those micro ways in which we are commoning and how can we sort of scale that up and then recognizing, you know, some of those larger values of water as life um, that there, it's tapping into these ideas uh, that have always sort of been there, but have been drowned out by advertising, been drowned out by nationalistic ideas around, around our water. Um, and so I find it a very useful and emergent sort of discourse around commons, even though it does have some ways in which it can be misinterpreted or even uh, and should be made suspicious of when not used properly. Mm -hmm. Love that. Or not, um, not, not properly, but using ways in which, are, again, are, aren't, aren't um, sensitive to settler colonialism. Mm -hmm. Um, and everything you've said can take me off in like a half hour worth of conversation. Like you, you, you hit like 20 different wonderful launch points, but I just want to go quiet for a second and find out everybody else on the call, where would you like to, to uh, dive into these issues to, to play a little bit on the water, water metaphor? Everybody else, Jemay, David? I was uh, curious, Paul, in our in our interactions this week, and we were talking about belonging, uh, that you had hyphenated the word. Uh, instead of belonging, it was be hyphen longing. Can you share your reason for doing that? Um, sure. I mean, I'm also a cultural studies person, so I'm always interested in language and deconstructing uh, ideas. And so I think, you know, Part of this, part of this recovery is is a longing, is a longing for connection, a longing for community, a longing for um, a different world, and so I think being in that state of longing um, is one that again is outside of fighting against, you know, this issue, uh, us and them. Um, it's really an affirmation that. Um, not knowing the full picture, but coming from a sense of desire and a, and a sense of, 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 of belonging is, is, is cuts across so many, so many other divisions. And so, you know, I think it's a human, human trait that is, that is, you know, you could say it's, it's probably squashed by, by discourses of control, uh, of, uh, of happiness, um, and of, of, you know, of never having enough. And so, yeah, I just think the, lo the idea of desire and longing for place. I mean, another part of this is a lot of stuff around um, commons is the social commons, be it online, digital commons, or social institutions, libraries, or public education. Um, I think what makes some of this work unique is it's very land-based. It's, it's, it's a watershed-based. And um, that, there's a, there's, a, there's a saying or an elder I heard once talking about, you know, environmental ethics. And, you know, his line was, 
you know, live as if you're going to be living here for a long time. Live as if you're not going to be going somewhere else. And so I think that sort of staying put um, yeah, and that sense of belonging to place um, can go a long way when we think about that, again, that idea of guardianship uh, and being a good ancestor. If we consider uh, that, you know, whatever we put down the drain or whatever we put in the air or whatever we um, put down to the trash, we are still going to have to live with and we are still belonging to that regardless if it's out of uh, our periphery. And so I think that sense of place-based belonging is, is an also a positive environmental uh, ethic that, again, goes beyond reducing waste, goes beyond uh, mitigating harm, or, and goes beyond, again, sort of technological fixes around decarbonization or water quality technologies. It's really, again, it's a, it's a kinship-based approach, um, not only to a social kinship, but an ecological uh, one as well. And so I, I think it's a powerful, for me, it, it works. It, it motivates me for the work. Um, it motivates others. And I think it, it not only does it fit well within an indigenous worldview, it's also something drastically lacking from, uh, you know, a, individualized society which we feel like we could go anywhere do anything um be with anyone at any given time um this idea of be of belonging to a particular place um yeah it, re, it just helps reconnect i love that um paul my own journey to the similar sets of issues you just presented starts roughly with the word consumer 20 years ago for me where i realized i didn't like the word at the time i was a tech industry analyst and partly consumerism hijacked our desires. It basically depends on manipulating our desires so we will consume more because as good consumers, our job is to buy a lot of shit and not worry so much about where it goes and what happens to it. And it, it, consumerism sort of played out requires us to not be mindful of that commons. And yet the funny thing is that when we consume a lot of stuff and, and act as, as good consumers, we end up longing for a sense of community, a sense of connectedness, all the kinds of things that are snipped away when the focus is really individualism. So, so, so that's a little piece of my narrative for how we got to this spot. One of the things I found really interesting is that on the far right, um, they're achieving a sense of belonging by being outsiders and undermining the status quo. And there's, there's sort of this insurrectionist feeling that causes bonding teamwork, camaraderie, what have you, around destructionism, let's call it, or nihilism of some certain sort, where it's like, screw it, the system's broken, we don't like how the system works, and I think we all could have a really interesting critique of the system and why it's broken, but, but there's a bunch of people sort of on the opposite side of the issue, and I don't know if opposite's the right word there, um, who, are, who are bonding and finding a sense of connectedness that's very different from the kind of thing we're talking about. So I, I love your emphasis on not just mitigating harm, but rather just doing the positive things that need to be done. Um, I, you know, I was awoken, I awakened a lot by like the books 1491 and 1493 by Charles Mann, where in 1491 he says, look, two thirds of the landmass of, of North and South America were under active human management. Uh, before Columbus hits hits land, it just doesn't look like picket fences and monocrops. It looks like forest gardens. It looks like controlled fer uh, prairie burns. It looks like living with the land beautifully. Uh, another book that just that I read more recently that really affected me was is uh, Against the Grain, uh, by James Scott, who is brilliant on this. If you haven't read any James Scott, I highly recommend him. And he's basically undermining this idea that civilization coincides with domestication of grains and was a good thing for us. He basically is like, no, 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 we resisted civilization of that kind for a long time. So, so I, think we're, I think what's interesting about this very moment that we're in is that we're, we're duking this out. Like the issues that we're talking about here, we're going deeper than your average conversation, certainly deeper than the news media gets to go. But, but this is a live conversation in the moment and we have access to media where the marginal cost of publishing ideas and holding this conversation has fallen to zero. Uh, and where notions like commoning can get some traction and some air. So I'm wondering, what are the points of leverage that you're most excited about in this messy mix? Like where, where are you putting your energy these days um, to really, um, to maybe, and I, I'm assuming, to cause the most positive change? Hey, Paul, I, I, would, I would love to hear um, 
about the results, and this would be new to me too, of your currency project last year, and how the circulation of the currency contributed to the commoning. Yeah, uh, well, a couple, yeah, I mean, um, uh, we've done several projects, uh, usually sort of prototypes type things, or again, we have limited uh, financial capacity, but um, as ways to animate that common ink. Um, and yeah, we are interested in transformative change. Uh, uh, there are lots of groups working on uh, water justice or water governance um, that make a difference, um, but um, they are working, you know, usually against or within the system. Um, we, Great uh, Commons is working with those groups but we feel like we have the privilege of operating in the space also of trying to work beyond the current system. And so what is that current system? You know, my background also as well was in sort of critiquing consumer culture. I sort of grew up in the nineties with Adbusters and this, so I think in some ways my ideas are commons are influenced by that. Uh, I didn't even have a language of commons, I wish I did. Um, I just knew what I was against. I was against consumerism. I didn't really have the language for what would be its uh, replacement. The, but I think years later, the Great Lakes Commons has given me the opportunity to practice some of these theories. Uh, and one of them is around value. And so a year and a bit ago, we got a small seed grant from the Cosmos Journal to think about value and think about exchange and think about money that had to do with the watershed. And so we printed 5,000 uh, notes, uh, not calling them bills, but notes uh, that were all of the same value. Each had their own unique share number on them. And we encouraged people to give them away um, as a please or a thank you. Here I was tapping into the language, uh, the nonviolent communication um, language that you know all human communication can be reduced, according to Marshall Rosenberg, down to a please or a thank you. And so thinking about the, about the sort of supply and demand side of uh, thank you and please, using these notes as a way to exchange um, acknowledgements between people in the Great Lakes. So if you had taken some form of action to protect the Great Lakes or protect water, uh, you would be getting one of these notes as a, as a thank you. Um, and if you wanted somebody to take an action uh, in any sort of way, again, the user defines, the giver defines the value, not, not me or, or Great Lakes Commons. Um, if, if I would like you to engage in some kind of action, then my exchange would be based on a please. And so we distributed 5,000 of those notes across the Great Lakes. I'm still in the process of writing it up. Uh, I've got distracted from other, other prototype projects. But we literally, you know, this is a, so many online um, engagement tactics these days. We, you know, just mailed stuff out. So we, we mailed several hundred packages out with 10 notes in each with instructions on how to use them and to our charter supporters and also various events that we were at. So these were in some ways really as common calling cards, but also a way for us to start thinking about, well, what is, what is money based on and, and, and what is value based on? Because it seems like so much of the industrial nonprofit model is, you know, from foundations or from tax bases that are, have gathered that money through the exploitation and, and uh, extraction uh, of wealth. And what we're working with in the environmental movement uh, are crumbs. Uh, the, 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 the only way we're going to get more money uh, for charity is to dig up more, to, to burn more, to rob more. And so if money, I'm also a fan of Charles Eisenstein's work around sacred economics, um, if, if money really is one of those things that does not rot, does, that basically enables greed and enables a little less accumulation for, for, no more, for no reason other than more accumulation, then what kind of incentives or what kinds of um, tools are we making to sort of balance that or to question that? And so having a currency of care, so care being the economy, the economy is based on care, not on, um, a wage or not based on hours. You may be familiar with other community currency projects that are based on hours 
or some sort of dollar equivalent. Um, this exchange value is based on just caring for water and the, the, the giver uh, determining that value. And ultimately connecting that care back to the waters with the understanding that if we take care of the waters, then we will be wealthy for as long as, as long as forever. And that, that is the water is the reason why we're here and the water is the, the, not only the source of all of life, but also the economy as well. And so we had um, lots of feedback on that. We had um, a webinar. Um, I presented the findings, some findings at an ecological economics conference this past year in Montreal. And there's information about it on our website. And we've even got some stories on our commons map, which is a sort of a collaborative storytelling map I mentioned earlier, where people could put, put in like, you know, who they gave it to and why uh, on, on a map of the Great Lakes. And so that was a form of not only engagement in Great Lakes, but also, again, a, a, a transformational way of engaging in these questions around value and economics and environmental responsibility in something that people can actually do face to face with something material and also feeling like you're part of a larger, a larger project. So that's an outline of some of the, the intentions of that currency of care project, uh, yet as another expression of, you know, again, creating a sense of belonging around the Great Lakes, regardless of your other kind of identities. Mm -hmm. And they expired. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're yeah, picking up on that idea that, you know, money doesn't rot, where everything else in nature does rot this idea of that at the end of the year, this could have been a design flaw as well, who knows, but um, was that these notes would all so-called expire by the end of the year as a way of encouraging people to use them. Uh, money is only, money should only be as useful as it is when it's exchanged, not just having value sitting on, on the shelf. And so we really wanted to encourage people to use these notes that their value is through their use, not through their simple accumulation and that and which is also again the opposite of what our current uh, economy is like and so we put we you know we literally put an exp expiration date on this um so as a way to sort of prototype this project to see how it went and then just to consider how we would uh, reboot it um for another another round later so yeah the end of the year 2017 um officially you can't you can't use them anymore but i do have a couple left if anybody wants uh, i can mail you some as a memento uh, two of us just typed into the chat about demerge currencies, which are which have uh, basically negative interest rates. So they don't they don't die at one moment, but they actually depreciate over time, and you can set how much in order to encourage people to put them in into use. I remember yep. years ago, I uh, I had a, a consulting engagement in Buenos Aires, Argentina, when they were undergoing pretty close to hyperinflation, and uh, I, I was getting a per diem of X thousand um, uh, pesos. Uh, every 10 days or so and I got mine once before a five-day holiday and and I was like oh crap I kind of need to spend a lot of this right now or it's not going to be worth very much after five days of not you know everything kind of being shut it was it kind of it was a frightening realization that uh, that that was happening and that was that was real world money um, water is a weird asset in that it's at least in Western society completely undervalued and also, we don't necessarily want to put a dollar value on it. But we have we have made water artificially cheap through large hydro projects. I mean, if you read uh, like Desert, for example, it's a bit of a mind blower about the economics of water and how stupid that is, and how and how we we are in races to create ever less economical projects to get one of the farmers and others um, that, that really kind of warped a lot of a lot of things. Um, also. Our appreciation of water seems kind of low. Uh, a friend of mine uh, took me on a tour of Beijing once uh, long ago. Uh, her name is Betsy Damon. She's the keeper of the waters. And uh, she's had several projects in the US, but she, she created a, a park uh, on a river on a city in China. I don't remember which city anymore. It wasn't one of the major ones we know. And it was a fish-shaped park where water came off the river into the mouth of the fish went through settlement, aeration, kind of a, a whole series of natural processes to clean the water in a way that you could walk on top of because there were stones and, and, and you know, platforms and whatever you could see what was happening. And then the tail of the fish basically put the water back into the river cleaner. It, it was a beautifully you know, ex thought of uh, a project and I have no idea if it's still, uh, if it's still going. Um, but how, water is like insanely complicated. Right, uh, that there's the there's the battle over water rights in Bolivia. Uh, the revolution will not be televised. Is a good documentary about that. How did water get so complicated? 
No idea. I, it is. Well, it's, I mean, a, it's a horrible, yeah, I mean, messy subject. Yeah, I mean, for me, I only uh, it was, I'd love to hear from the group, but I mean, I think water is a pretty good teacher. I think we've we spent a long time trying to uh, learn about water, and uh, I think it's going to be time that we learn from water. And I think water is can can show us really how to be together. It can really show us how to cooperate and how to um, how how things how all these things are interconnected. Water does a pretty good job of balancing those things out. And so I'm. I, you know, these are complex systems and, and there's lots, I, I deal mostly with the water ethics end of it, as you can tell, um, mm -hmm. not so much with the water management. Um, but I think, you know, to go, to, we, we did another project um, called Water Friendship that was looking at indicators, uh, relational indicators, uh, rather than looking at water quality indicators, we were looking at um, the question, like, what is our, how good is our relationship with water doing? And from that, we used some of Joanna Macy's work around change. Uh, that's where I got the holding action, harm reduction language from. She talks about starting, you know, creating new social institutions. But without the third piece to that sort of um, TP of, of change, we got to shift the consciousness. And so I think, you know, there's lots of consciousness shifting movements out there. And I, and I, and, you know, not all of them are the same or, or coming from the same political place. But I think um, part of the work we're doing is re-examining what, what is the economy? What is the nation state? Um, what is, we, where are we going with this? And again, we, we've learned all we can about water and mm -hmm. maybe there's some, still some things to learn from water uh, because the, the management of it is, I think for me, my background is, once we get the ethics straight, then the management becomes much simpler. But mm -hmm. if we're if we're constantly trying to manage something as a utility or as a resource or as an asset, um, we're we're going to just get highly highly more highly complex systems to manage it, um, and most likely manage it poorly. So we are building in these. Um, what's the difference? You know, the sort of the the safe. We rather than doing safe, safe fails, we're doing fail safes, and I think we are seeing the those those complex systems. Why does in the ass? As we see um, Lake Erie dying, as we see pipelines approved every day. Uh, you know, the state of Michigan, they just approved another uh, well for Nestle, the same time that people are getting their water shut off in Detroit, and people are being asked, forced to pay for poisoned water in Flint. Wow. Uh, we just saw line three get approved in Wisconsin, um, against all common sense, and Back to the Michigan, they had 80,000 people submit um, declarations against that Nestle application, and it was still approved. And so we're we're seeing these these so-called democratic or these civil um, society processes break down, fail. Uh, all the logic around keeping stuff in the ground and who is the government actually working for, we can see that completely falling apart. No one. We could, pick, we could pick one of a thousand examples. And so I think it's that new story uh, that we are all sort of trying to understand. Mm -hmm. We're in that space between stories, perhaps. And I think if we get the ethic right and we get the relationships right, we can figure out the rights part. But I think, you know, we've, we've, we've had 200 years of water rights um, in sort of consumer culture. And uh, we're just starting to hear more and more, again, thanks to our indigenous leaders, about water responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about a shift here, and I think water is part of it, and water for me is, is a leading part of that, but it's certainly interconnected with all the other social movements that we are all aware of and care about. Love that. Um, Dave Witzel's been hip deep, maybe nostril deep in the regenerative economy and a lot of issues around this, and I think you were about to jump in, so I'm preempting your jump. Go for it. <laughs> Well, actually, I, I guess I have two questions. Because one is I'd love to just back one step around the currency. I know you're, you said you were writing it up, but I'd be curious if you got any kind of like, what are you gonna write? I mean, what, how did it work? What kind of reaction did you get from folks with the, um, with the, the gift currency? Yeah, we got a lot, we got a real mixed bag. We got people who, a few, a few people who really got it. I did my best to explain it as best that I could. But again, I was influenced by a variety of sources and I think most people don't think about money. They don't think about the economy, even though they may care about water. And so our audience is people who care about water, but many of them in terms of economics, uh, they don't really know. And so we, a lot of confusion, a lot of having to explain and really sort of um, 
try to, on the one hand, keep it simple with the please or thank you. But on the other hand, um, it is rather different. And people are like, well, wait, I, you know, how does this work again? Like, I just give it to somebody. And so it was, it was, a, it was an intervention uh, as much as anything. It was a way of, of disrupting and starting, hopefully starting a conversation. Um, so I think the, the success or the, the outcome was partially the stories we got on the map and that I heard through email or, or you know, through the conference I went to. But I'll, I think a lot of it won't be measured in terms of um, people's confusion and people's having to sort of think about, I don't know what to do with this. I do think there is some transformative um, juice to confusion, to disruption, um, to even not knowing, but wanting to understand, wanting to learn, wanting to get these things in the mail, wanting to participate, even though there was maybe some confusion around how does this work and, and why are we doing this exactly. Um, and so as you could, as I explained, like there are several layers to that, that was questioning value and exchange and even like, expiration dates. Um, but that was, that was the prototype. And so we just did it for, for eight months. And you know, the, there's more information on our website um, about that. And um, it was, again, trying to blend together various other critiques and examples of currency projects um, the best way I, I could figure out how. I'm not sure if that answers your uh, question. And I empathize because I, I know like Jerry's had, you know, Art Brock come and talk with us a couple of times and, and I get like a 20% of what it is he's explaining. It's like the currency stuff is just totally baffling to me. So, yeah. and it's, you know, it is funny to think that, I don't know, somehow calorie shells worked at one point. I don't understand why. You know, well, part, partly early currencies worked around intangibles or, or uh, incommensurate things like Graeber says. And, you know, it was like you, you buy a bride and it's like, you know, how many, how many cowrie shells is a bride worth? Well, about this many. So, so it was, it was kind of the, the, a different conversation. It wasn't, it wasn't pricing in markets like we have. Well, then the other thing yeah, I was, I was also, about, just to add in, if I don't mind, there was also an article, uh, a report uh, that was edited by David Bollier, who writes about commons. He's written a few books. And he was part of a conversation about two years ago that was written up and it was looking at care and, and trying to form an economy around, around the, the service of care and the expression of care. And there was about 15 different you know, thought leaders. And I think that also influenced my, my thinking around care being a, a form of a value that is, again, is... Um, is infinite uh, and yet also really needed right now because right now we have a lot we have money not going to where it's needed and we have a lot of need with no with, without any resources financial resources to get that care animated and so mm -hmm. i think that report with by, by, hosted by david boyer influenced this idea of, of care as a, as a as a as a value as a, as a as an exchange value his work is pretty central in this area he's done he's done lots of stuff uh, dave did you want to go deeper into other regenerative issues well, you know, I was just going to ask you I, about the, the 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 water examples you used, you know, Detroit and Flint, and 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 I'd love to tease that out because I kind of I quarrel with some of the stuff, and I but I don't have the data. I mean, it seems to it seems to me water is one of the areas, at least in the U.S., where we have made dramatic improvements over the last thirty or forty years. I mean, I, I don't and I don't know the status of Erie, but I don't think it catches on fire. You know, it's not the Cuyahoga anymore. And I saw, you know, the recent report that the Chesapeake has actually improved over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, it, is it, I mean, how do we kind of realistically understand the status of, I mean, Flint isn't a water problem. It's a pipe problem, right? Um, well, both. I mean, the water, the front river that they took the water out of was polluted. So uh, if that water, if that river wasn't as polluted, or it was more polluted than, than Lake Huron, where the water was coming from before. So there was a source issue there, source water. But it's, it's, it was also mismanagement. It was also, it was also old pipes, yep. Yes, I'm just, there seems to be a lot of things that we uh, activists talk about. And then the, you know, the neoliberals, I guess I'm probably a neoliberal 
So we'll point and say, look, you know, it's not, it's not as bad as it was 40 years ago. We've had dramatic improvement using some of Yeah, the but brands. my thing is, okay, but, but this is the thing. Sorry to cut you off, but I just go passionate about this stuff so oh, much. Good. Yes, I've heard that one. Oh, it's better than it was in the 70s. In the 70s, nobody even came down here. This was all industry, you know, and now it's, people are kayaking, uh, you know, in Cleveland and all the rest of it. But why we pick that as our, why we pick 40 years and why, why not pick 100 years as our, as our comparison and, and we're still dealing with the legacies of all those brownfields and toxic hotspots. Um, there's a lot of cancer clusters that aren't being reported. And again, the, most people's water literacy, myself included, that if we think the water is clear, it's somehow less polluted. However, that's just, that's just zebra mussels eating all of the, eating all the stuff in it, you know, uh, all the, all the, uh, all the biological matter. And so there's a lot of persistent toxic chemicals in the Great Lakes right now, more so than there ever has been because it doesn't go anywhere. Have certain things like lead or, you know, those things being reduced? For sure they have. Different can actually test for, for proprietary uh, reasons um, that no one's tracking. Like we're doing it a massive experiment on ourselves. And I'm not just talking about, you know, fluoridation here. We're talking about a massive experiment, which chemicals didn't exist in the 70s. And so the microplastics just being the latest example in which we are putting things out into the environment without any sort of precautionary principle of having to prove that we can figure out how to deal with these things before they hit the market. So now after 10 years of having microplastics in our cosmetics and things in the Great Lakes, we're slowly getting rid of them this year, 2018 in Canada and the States. But these things are gonna be around for another generation. Um, and so, you know, and so the, the, the water quality um, debate um, can be can be cherry picked to find examples of greater fish stocks here or cleaner water than in the 70s, but that's using the sort of one of the historical lows, and it's also forgetting about the thousands of chemicals which don't show up as easily or that we don't even test for. I mean, I'm right here by a beach uh, in Toronto, and they test for one. The beaches here, and probably where you are too, they test for one thing once a day, and that's E. coli uh, for public health. And why is that? Right. There's a lot of reasons. And so we are not even paying attention to the host of other things that are showing up in our bodies. Um, and as we have, we have one of our resources on our toolkit is looking at water bodies and plastics. So much of the microplastics um, issue is about consumerism and about cosmetics and about it being in the water. And maybe if we're at best, it's about it showing up in fish. But it's not talking about what our resource tried to do was thinking about our, our, ourselves, our, our bodies as water bodies, and how issues of reproductive justice are a, a part of this conversation around petrochemicals uh, in the environment. And we have we have a community near Sarnia um, on the on the Detroit River, um, which they have a, a male female birth ratio of two to one. And so they're surrounded by petrochemical industries um, producing plastic and many other sort of things, uh, never mind the, 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 the microplastics. And so we're thinking about polluting water with petrochemical and hormone disrupting substances, um, depending on where you go and the whole, you know, the, the maps of environmental justice will, will show that these the most directly impacted communities are marginalized communities. And we're not just talking about water bodies and lakes and aquifers, we're talking about for the most part, women's bodies being polluted in which their own breast milk couldn't be sold on the shelf because of its contamination. And so that may be better than the 70s for some. That certainly isn't a marker for me on where, where we're going as a society when people's bodies are too polluted to, to feed the young. Well, and I don't want to I, my point is not that there are no problems. My point is that the reason you choose the 70s is because the trend has been a trend of improvement since the 70s. So if you were to, to graph it, you would see it collapsing and you would see it improving. Now you can argue that the improvement's not fast enough, I think. But I guess the problem I have is with, uh, I feel like we do ourselves a disservice when we don't acknowledge kind of progress. And we don't acknowledge the fact that there are people who have been working on this issue, that there's you know a grand conspiracy to destroy the world. and and. You know, we, I think we, I don't know, it just feels to me, um, you know, we're not looking at the data in some sense, you know, it's like, yeah, 
Uh, I would love to look at the best example in the Great Lakes of stewardship or conservation and look and see how it, see what worked about it and see what that was for the focusing in on and the kinds of resources it took to get that change happening over a generation. And there are some examples. Um, and then to see how what, what, were, what are all the cascading ways that are undermining that very same, that very same action. Um, and so, you know, here we, we would need more of a biological science uh, perspective for fishery management, or we could look at the issue itself, but I, and, or looking at human health uh, sort of graphs. Um, but from my experience, after six years of Great Lakes stuff directly, the number of issues um, the ca and the, 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 the complex systems, including climate change and, and fossil fuel transportation, um, consumer culture waste, and again, crumbling in so the crumbling infrastructure the infrastructure gap is in the, the trillions in the United States and so I think Flint and Detroit are just tip of the iceberg I mean Milwaukee's not too far behind I mean we have we have a infra water infrastructure that is uh, failing and is polluting and that was put in and that we there, there is no political or financial will to, beyond privatization to upgrade those systems and so my, my thing is like Okay, so if you have clean water, so Toronto, right behind me, whenever it rains heavily here in Toronto, we get millions of liters of raw sewage going into Lake Ontario. This is one of the richest countries, one of the richest cities, and we can't afford to put in basic technology that, you know, wasn't around or wasn't thought about 100 years ago. We're not doing it. We're not doing it because we don't know. We're just not doing it because there's not enough, there's not enough outrage. Uh, the, the norm is that that's just, you know, that's just what's going to happen. And so that's only going to get worse with climate change and with more austerity um, across the world. Where is the, those trillions of dollars of waterworks money going to come from? And unless there is a uh, thorough, publicly supported, uh, long-term vision, I can tell you who it's gonna be. It's gonna be private corporations who are gonna be selling water just like they're selling Coca-Cola or, or beer. And we've seen how that results in terms of equity and inequity when it comes to water as a human right. And so I don't see, I mean, so, so water quality aside, um, the people in Detroit are ne right next to the largest freshwater system in the world, yet they cannot access it. Mm -hmm. So even if, what, even if we were to get, the Great Lakes were to be 100% purely drinkable. You could just go take a teacup and drink the Great Lakes. Even if that were true, I wish, I wish it was, we are moving into a system in which the, the water work systems that surround the Great Lakes will shut off the taps for people to be able to access water as a human right. So the comments part also dovetails into obviously water privatization as well as the sort of water quality um, aspects. I guess my, my comment earlier that water is a messy issue was merely foreshadowing <laughs> the later parts of our conversation. Um, what, around the Great Lakes, what are the, what are the hot spots of good activity of communities that are actually engaged? I assume there's multiple because it's a really large area, especially if you go all the way out the headwaters at, at, near the Atlantic, near Nova Scotia and all that. Uh, it's a very large water system. Um, where are, can, can you just tell us, share a couple stories of, of groups that are doing great work somewhere in the, in the broad territory? Yeah, wonderful. I mean, I, I don't have, to, uh, sorry, I don't have too much hope about the water itself, but I have lots of hope about the people who are working for that sense of belonging and yeah. uh, guardianship. I mean, I could, I could go on all day, but I'll mention a couple very quickly. Um, there are the Anishinaabe uh, water walkers, sacred water walkers, who have traveled and walked part of the Great Lakes. Here we're talking about a, a, a ceremony, indigenous women-led ceremony that is really living the, the phrase, water is life, water is sacred. They've been doing this for about 15 years. And wherever they go, they raise awareness around that interconnectedness, that idea of responsibility I spoke of earlier. And as you're on these walks, and they're open to uh, everyone, uh, by being with the water for the for that hour or for that day or for that week, one does gain a, a closer connection, sense of responsibility and belonging to that waterway. And so Sacred Water, walk, water Walkers are doing amazing work that's connecting people across place and, and, and culture. Uh, there's a group called Milwaukee Water Commons, which at a, at a city level, I would love to see mirrored in every, every city in the world, in which they have been trying to connect water walkers with water workers, thinking about um, intergenerational ways of getting kids and, and, and people and multicultural society involved. 
issues of bottled water, water recreation, water decision making, and getting people having sort of art of hosting conversations where people are actually having their own forums, designing the kind of water futures they would like to see versus leaving it into the hands of lawyers and engineers and scientists uh, only. And so really sort of trying to democratize that idea of water governance, uh, I would point to, uh, and Milwaukee Water Commons also does bring in the sort of the arts and culture into that as well. So it's mm. a much richer form of, of, of human communication when it comes to why this issue is important. Often if, if, if the issue is presented as an issue of parts per million or around legal rights, your, your likelihood of getting people involved is pretty low. Most people yeah. involved is, is pretty I mean, low. You know, in Detroit, I, I, you know, there's, there's an amazing host of groups. I was just in Detroit three weeks ago, and you know, there's having the, they're having weekly uh, rallies. They are connecting across. They are connecting with issues of poverty, uh, issues of, of human rights, um, issues of urbanization and urban renewal to find solutions to these problems because the, the politicians are, are just not doing it at, at all. We've seen people in Windsor physically bring clean tap water over to Detroit. Um, organized a couple of years ago with these with these shutoffs so here we're seeing sort of a cross cross border so solidarity work and so those are three examples I, I could go on all day but I'm seeing a lot of people um, that's kind of the focus of my work actually is supporting and integrating and, and connecting the various types of kinship that are going on uh, to really uh, focus in on that water relationship which is the core of that commenting and that, the sort of Great Lakes belonging work to begin with and because whatever the local issue is that of contamination or, or, or shut off, that's the one thing that everyone can do. So mm -hmm. those are some examples. Do you find that these convenings are trans or cross political or are they mostly progressives showing up with, you know, uh, indigenous Americans or, or like what's, what's the mix? Is, is this an issue that, that lots and lots of people are happy to engage in across the spectrum? Well, they're each different. So I would say though, the sacred water walks are very, are women's women centered, uh, usually women over 50 uh, and usually sort of 50, 50 native, non-native women. Um, and so you wouldn't see that kind of crowd at, at a bicycle rights kind of rally, in my opinion. Um, Detroit, it's, it's, it's an inner city, mostly racialized, mostly poor sort of civil rights struggle uh, for the most part in terms of who shows up uh, for that. And Milwaukee Water Commons, I would say, is, is, is representative of Milwaukee itself. I can't say the same is true for Toronto-based water activism. Toronto-based water activism is very white, even though it's where half the city is, is uh, of color. And it's the Toronto water activism, however it does great work, um, is mostly focused on recreational um, water issues and not so much, uh, because of the political context too, not so much water privatization, water access, um, and in terms of the water in inequities, um, partially because those inequities aren't as dire as mm -hmm. they are in Detroit, but partially just that's, just, that's also the, the, the focus of the leaders of those groups who themselves are also more privileged white people. And so uh, I would say that my three examples uh, are uh, just, just, just random three examples compared to, you know, a Reclaim the Streets party or I mean, I'm not sure what we're comparing it to, but to use a bicycle rights sort of um, generalization, I would say it's uh, pretty diverse and not necessarily your average, what do we want, whatever, fight back, stand up, whatever. It's, it's, it's not that kind of thing. I mean, like, sacred water walks are explicitly not a political rally. Mm -hmm. uh, they are not a protest. They are their ceremony. And so I think that for me already speaks volumes around the, the kind of consciousness, the kind of ethic, the kind of belonging that we're sort of working toward in many ways that it's this is not just about fighting back which needs to be done i mean detroit is very much the fighting back sort of thing and so part of the work i do is working with groups that are doing again the working within against and beyond work and so it's different people and different ones but i i would say a healthy a healthy diversity of of, uh, of society in, involved with these things that are important to them yeah, thank you. Um, Mark, Jemay, do you have any questions uh, for Paul? Do you want to say anything? Good. Um, I, could, um, I could keep talking about water for a really long time, unfortunately, and, but I'm very aware that you're standing under scaffolding near a ferry uh, and you've been really generous with your time. Uh, is there anything that we can answer for you or is there some way we can be helpful to you? 
maybe just a quick line on, on, on what you guys need about on a regular basis. I mean, I'd like, yeah, I'd love to, um, I mean, it was maybe it was in the notes that Todd shared. No, 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 I, I would I, just I, love to know a bit more on the sort of on what brings this group together, and then I would may have a question. I would love to, to ask a question if I knew a bit more context. Cool. Um, so uh, the, the relationship economy expedition is Rex, and the relationship economy is an idea that showed up in my head uh, 10, 12, something like that years ago uh, when I started realizing that consumer mass market capitalism had eaten our brains and our lifestyles and what we think of ourselves, it basically ate everything. And that there were lots and lots of groups around the world that were rediscovering trust, relationships, society, community, connectedness, all the kinds of things that used to matter long ago. Uh, sometimes naively rediscovering them, sometimes like, you know, actually saying, hey, wait, we have to go back to these principles. Um, and, and most of these movements don't know about each other. So, you know, open source software doesn't know much about traffic calming, doesn't know much about, uh, you know, open democracy or, or other sorts of things. And so uh, Rex is basically, it's kind of like a mastermind group or a salon-like affair where um, change agents in lots of different walks of life uh, with many different purposes and sometimes with cats. Um, uh, come together and we talk about uh, what what do these principles mean? Who's applying them? What can we learn from them? How do we apply them in our own spheres of activity? Uh, how do we accelerate this shift into a relationship economy? Uh, and for me personally, I discovered recently that so much of this is really about trust. That you know, uh, a year ago, if you had asked me what I did, you know, so Jerry, what do you do at a cocktail party? I'd be like, oh, I'm I'm a guide to the relationship economy, which mostly provokes the. Eh? Kind of response like a, you know a dog with a cocked ear like i know you said words but i'm not sure what you said and and these days i say like i'm a guide to trust i, I work on trust not not the not the financial instrument but rather the thing between humans and between humans and companies and countries and all that the thing that seems to be pretty screwed up uh that some people are working really hard to figure out how to fix um so that, that's kind of the background on it and we uh i, I formed rex in 2010 uh, and then uh, in 2017, kind of turn it inside out a bit more. So uh, at this point, I'm, I'm recruiting more people who are, who are examples of the relationship economy at work in the world to come in and join us as fellows, for example. Mm -hmm. That sounds awesome. It's kind of cool. It's, yeah, I mean. Works all right. I mean, and when you use the word economy, you, you don't, it's, you, you mean like just the exchange of trust. So actually, when I say relationship economy, when I named it that, it was intentionally an oxymoron or some yeah. kind of weird mishmash because you don't buy and sell actual relationships in an in yeah. economy, right? So uh, it, it, maybe it's gift exchange, maybe it's something else, but it, it, the, the name was meant to open up that can of worms that, that there you go. you're clearly yeah. aware of. Yeah, and um, I, I should get off the phone uh, here sooner than later. Um, it is Friday afternoon, and um, I, but I but I guess I would love to hear from you or anybody else around the one thread around place that I feel like that relationship to place. Uh, what are some other examples where you see it uh, alive and well, or at least emerging? Because uh, I, I, I love and support the other examples you used as well. Um, the Commons Map actually uses open source software. Um, called Ushahidi, Ushahidi crisis right. mapping software, and so the commons of, of, of software. And so, but I'm really uh, curious on anybody else's uh, thoughts on on uh, the relationship to place and how how we are nurturing that economy. Um, I'm happy to jump in with a couple ideas, and then if anybody else wants to uh, riff on it, that'd be great. Uh, one of my kind of early mentors was a professor uh, at Penn named Russell Acuff, who was one of the inventors of systems thinking. And he did a lot of work in West Philly with what became known as the Young Great Society. And they did a lot of good for West Philly, which is not the, not the best place on earth. Um, and then it turned out that when those people sort of graduated on and moved out of town and went and did their own things, and each, each had interesting careers, that West Philly went back downhill. Um, so that, that raised an early question for me about, do you, are you developing people or place and how does that work? Um, the second thought is, Mobility is what's really screwed this up because up until around 1850 or whatever, most people didn't move more than three kilometers from home their whole lives. Like we were local. We were really local. And transportation, you know, the cars, trains, you know, planes, all that kind of stuff, inexpensive transportation shifted that dramatically. Now a bunch of us move around all the time. And, and then somewhere in the last 30 years, corporations stopped thinking that place mattered 
and they started thinking that only economics mattered. So they felt less responsibility for people or place. And unfortunately, they have a really huge impact on place because when, when a factory that's employed a third of the town moves out of town or shuts down entirely, the town is devastated. And we've just, we've just seen that all, you know, all around the U.S. in, in different ways. So, um, and then across all of that is the background radiation of this word consumer and the consumerization of society that happened for the last 50 to 100 years, which has separated us actively from a sense of place and a sense of community, uh, really foregrounding the individual and our own happiness and fulfillment uh, through the acquisition of stuff. So th that, that mix is like a vile brew for thinking about our relationship or our responsibility to place and to one another, which is the thing that I think is super simple that is how society used to be. Um, and what I, what I love is hearing about any kind of movement like yours that is actually foregrounding this and saying, hey, this is actually important and it ain't that hard. Uh, and here's some ways to experience it. And here are some groups that are doing it and come on in the water's fine. Right? Anybody else want to take a, a swing at the notion of place? I mean, the other, I don't, I think, I'm not sure it's exactly the same thing you mean, but in, the, in a lot of the stuff I've been looking at recently, it's, you've been, it's been with a landscape focus in that, you know, you actually have a multitude of issues you'd like to deal with. So it's, it's, you know, water and food and, you know, healthy kids and good education in there. But, but the, we try to deal with them in a piecemeal way and it, you know, you fix one and break another kind of. Um, so the, the solution has been a little bit to try to take that holistic landscape based perspective and say, look, we're going to intervene in a systemic way in this landscape. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, I've, I've found it's been really helpful to kind of think critically about um, the kind of opportunities for improvement by, by having that geographic focus. So that I think it is a place. Um, and I don't really understand kind of the you know, uh, the importance of, you know, I think the define ownership of the place and the defining of the place must be really critical too. But, but for me, it's been more at this analytic level. And then, you know, I just think a link to the, to the Lowe's Plateau regeneration effort is, you know, kind of a fun example of, you know, something that's been happening in a place where they've done kind of remarkable transformations of the land. Um, this is the Lowe's Plateau in China. That's the size of Belgium, basically, that got reclaimed in many ways. Um, and and ironically, a, a World Bank project, right? Yeah, and Dave, what you just said rang for me in a, in a curious way, which is uh, there are groups that think that if we just focus on soil health, soil fertility, everything else good kind of tumbles out of that if we pay attention to soil. So it's the opposite of let's mind all the different systems in the landscape. And, and I don't know which, which, which way I lean, but, but I know that like focusing on soil, like if you ask Joel Salatin, the farmer in West Virginia, what he does, he says, I raise grass. And it turns out that he sells beef and chickens and whatnot off his farm. But, but if you, you know, I raise grass because what he's, what he's paying attention to is um, how does the grass get healthier after every cycle of animals feeding off it uh, kind of thing. So it, this is all about what do you pay attention to and um, what I think also what is simple enough that it gets people's imagination so that they get involved. I think that's a huge thing here because, because ecology, economy, pollutants, all that stuff is a hyper object. It's a, it's a wicked problem. It's a thing too big to grasp and too big to feel like we can have an effect on it. So things like, hey, you know, do you have healthy soil or not? Do you even know what healthy soil smells like? That's a very palpable uh, physical thing that can connect people. And it, it's, you know, once you've, once you've felt healthy soil and then you go back and see what yours is doing and then start to fix, that's a, that's a very direct thing you can do. I don't know, anybody else? Mark, you've got lots of exposure to lots of these things. I, I'd love to just be able to monitor all the different, all the different. You've, t you've put a couple of things in our chat, but what are you thinking? Uh, well, I, I think uh, locality or localism is really important. And in, in some ways it seems to be the, you know, one of the most promising ways forward, so to speak. And, and I think another line of thought I've, I've had is that there's, it's not just in terms of economy and thrival on that aspect, but even in terms of our basic sanity, there's some kind of relationship we have as human beings to the land uh, and to you know, the whole biology in that, which uh, I think we're just beginning to discover how important that is for us. And I think we're discovered maybe, maybe negatively through the counter example of you know, what 
our tool systems, you know, like Facebook and so on, are, do, are doing to our state of mind. Um, so, so, so that's kind of one uh, line of thought around there. But I, but I think the main one is kind of working locally. Uh, there was this line of children's stories called the Dinotopia series, uh, which talked about notion of habitat partners, where the, you know, this was this kind of fantasy world where there were dinosaurs and people. But the idea was that you had a partnership of a, a person and a dinosaur, and they would take care of a local region. And I, I, I love that idea that uh, you have that sen this kind of sense of responsibility and it's interspecies, which I think we, we're lo we've lost in, in a very real way. And I think uh, going forward would be pretty significant. So That's cool. That's interesting. That would be a good one, a good series to send to evangelical communities since they seem to think that humans and dinosaurs coexisted. What the heck? Let's, yeah. see, if we, let's see if we can harness that energy. Yeah. <laughs> Any closing thoughts? Otherwise, I'll... I'll Pass the floor back to Paul and back to Todd. Just one something really quick. This is what uh, what Mark was saying has reminded me of this. I had a conversation with science fiction writer Kim Stanley Robinson a couple of years ago, and we were talking about the idea of colonizing other planets. And uh, Stan Robinson is best known for his Mars trilogy: Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars, um, which is all about colonizing Mars, obviously. And he was arguing kind of persuasively, I think, that it's going to be very difficult for humans to live on other worlds, not because of radiation or anything like that, but because of microbes, that we are intimately tied to not just to our gut microbes, but to the soil microbes. Mm -hmm. Our bugosphere. To the, to the uh, yeah, well, the microbiome all around us. And moving to some place with no microbiome to speak of is going to be very, very difficult. So when we, when we decide to live elsewhere, because we, you know, we will at some point if we make it, um, we're not just talking about importing our foodstuffs, importing our technologies. We have to import our land. We have, mm -hmm. to, we have to take our place with us. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. It's like in uh, 1493, man talks about how the Americas had no earthworms before Columbus. So the understory was completely different in the Americas than in Europe. And so in the ballast, because you pile dirt in the bottom of ships, dirt and rocks to make ballast, in that ballast of some ships that break up on the shore are earthworms and boom, all of a sudden they spread across the Americas. And they eat the leaves and mulch the leaves differently than, it, than happened before and change the structure of the forests in America, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, holy crap, who thought of that? Like, how'd that happen? So, so all this stuff happens all the time. So what, what's going to happen when we, when we inhabit other planets? Uh, there's a slide I've been using in my last couple speeches. You'll see it briefly if you look at the personal democracy forum talk I did, where I'm like, some people just want to get us off this rock. Uh, I'm thinking here of Bezos and Musk and, et, et al, who have a lot of funds and are doing private space travel. And, I, and what I say is, unless we figure out this trust thing, you do not want to be on the first thousand spaceships off this rock. And there I, I point to Aurora, which is one of Robinson's books, uh, and also Seven Eves, and there's a bunch of other good, you know, dystopian sci-fi on what happens to, you know, to those travelers. Never mind looking at the biosphere or uh, the Mauna Kea uh, camp experiment or a bunch of other failed attempts to, to get just a small group of people to survive for a while in some kind of isolation. So that's another piece of it. Um, Paul and Todd, the last word goes to you guys. I defer to the Canuck. <laughs> Okay, well, um, I, 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 I'm on my phone here, and so I would love if somebody could save the chat, and I would love to get an email of that. I know because uh, I missed out on seeing those, and also I th there's probably some good resources for me to take a look at. Uh, it's easy to do. Um, Consider that done. Have you, got, have you got any other things added before we sign off today? Please, the dinosaur thing sounded really interesting, that sort of that workshop like the idea. Um, so, um, yeah, I just wanted to... I mean, I don't really know anybody here but Todd, but um, you guys sound like a fascinating group. And this whole, I never heard the phrase religious economy uh, before. And so um, thank you for all the introductions and your attention and your questions. And um, did the best I could. That's what I do every day. I just do the best I can with what I got. And um, yeah, I think, you know, here we are ourselves, spending an hour and a half on some relationship economy right here. So I just wanted to say, very privileged to feel invited here today and share what I share what I do with you, and 
wish everybody well and until next time, I guess. Thank you very much. We really appreciate your time. Uh, Todd, thank you very much for, for connecting us with Paul. Uh, this has been super interesting and useful and we will see where it goes. Thanks so much, Paul. Really appreciate all your work. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye.